We've all been pretending for most of our lives, and for most of that time, it was a pretense we could not even recognize or identify. We were told lies, and we in turn told those self-same lies to ourselves, because those lies were our truth. For many of us, it was not even a very long time ago that we were still feeding at the trough of blue pill wisdom, and yet, over time, we have learned anew. We have learned of female nature, and consequently of our own nature in relation to that nature, and we continue to seek understanding of female nature with a view towards understanding ourselves, and solely for that purpose do we seek knowledge of the human female. A far cry from the mystical, ethereal bond that exists only in the minds of the ignorant, it has been our task to peel away the layers of deception that you might know yourself, and know that which the world at large does not wish you to know, namely that in this business transaction you shall forever be the participant of lesser value. Whatever your attributes might be, you are an appliance to be used, and when the time comes, to be tossed away, as would be any other failed appliance with no forethought as to your human form and mind, you are there to do. Women are human beings, men are human doings. For most of us, the veil of the mystic has been removed. We understand that our past perceptions of female-male relations were founded on falsehood, and that is part of the pretense we all maintained. But today, I wish to speak of another aspect of the pretense, one which few will touch. If the human female views the human male as a discardable appliance in utility within the context of the so-called romantic relationship, how then does she view him outside of that relationship? I will claim that she has no view for man whatsoever. Man is invisible to woman in the collective sense. You as a man are nothing, not even an appliance. You are a non-entity. What fruit have women borne forth these past decades? Have they borne forth fruit, or have they borne forth thorns and thistles? Has the world of men collectively been duped into thinking they gather naught but fruit, even when all the while they are being entangled and cut to ribbons by their brambles? This is, of course, the grand deception, that of the female as fruit-bearer, as nurturer, as kindness embodied. And collectively speaking, it has served female kind well, for without this false perception, there never would have been a feminism, nor would have affairs reached the deplorable state they are currently in. And this is the key to understanding the pretense. We have a very real and biological bias that strives to prevent us from seeing the truth for what it is. But in the context of modernity, we can no longer afford the lie and pretense that men and women do not compete against each other. We most certainly do. Leave it to traditionalists to speak in reverence of the pluperfect, and lost idealists to fawn over the conditional. I shall only speak in the present. Make no mistake, this is a war. But it is not a war we started, though we are in part, through almost Neville Chamberlain-like acquiescence, responsible for the far-flung state it has reached. No, we did not start this war. It was foisted upon us with no mercy, and by a manifold of forces, the forces of politicized feminism, and feminism being little else than weaponized female nature by women themselves in their willingness to go along with it, by the state in caving in to women's every wish, by vote whore mongering politicians by currency in the form of female votes, and by our very nature, which refuses to recognize the female as a full human being, capable of virtue, yes, but equally capable of venality, flawed through and through, just as we all are. It is that biological nature that has deceived us, and deceives us even now, that tells us that women are innocuous, effete, and well-meaning. No doubt those were the guiding thoughts of legislators in matters of divorce, education, and employment in the past, for it is clear to me that it is also their current modus operandi. This is a war on men, but it is not a war of guns and bullets. Knowledge is our weapon. Our ammunition is our words. Consider what you as a man, more specifically as a quote-unquote utility, have to offer the world. You have your skill, and you have your experience, nothing else. And the question that must be posed in today's climate is, is that enough? Think about that when you apply for a job. You bring your skill and experience. 
your female counterpart and competitor has that and a veritable colossus of other support. She has state and force hiring quotas, she has congenital biological favoritism going for her, and she has the entire world behind her in its refusal to see a woman cry, let alone come home in a coffin. She has all of these things going for her, and she wants the job you want. Meanwhile, all you can see and read about is how men are falling behind and failing, how women are outperforming men, out-earning them. The list is endless. When the rhetoric is framed as such, can you honestly still keep a straight face and claim that we are not competing against women and that women are not competing against men? Of course, we are hindered by our instinct to help women, not see them as competitors. As can be seen, the seemingly harmless aid a male university student renders to a female by helping her complete a chemistry lab report. Would he have done the same for a man? I think not. We see other men as competitors, and by dint of nature, this is true. But just as we have moved past certain deterministic principles with regards to relationships with women, so too is it high time to move past them with regards to your fellow man. Knowing all you do now, staring at the torn rags of the veil of lies you once called life and truth, if I were to now pose to you the question, are you your brother's keeper? What answer, other than a resounding yes I am, could you possibly give? Rather than turning a competitive gaze upon your fellow male, while showing kindness and helpfulness to the female, I ask you to short-circuit your very nature and do the reverse, recalling man-woman myth's words, the other man is you, and I can assure you that that good will and forbearance that you show towards the woman is in no way reciprocated towards you. She can and will see you starve to death on the street, not out of malice, but simply because she gains some benefit from doing so. A benefit to her, of course. Remember, you are invisible, non-existent. It's not malice at all. It's simply business as usual. A special kind of sociopathy that, for reasons known to us for a while, has worldwide condemnation. But until we drop this collective pretense that women are somehow our natural partners, that they wish well upon us, as well as the pretense that feminism is anything but weaponized female nature, things will continue to become worse. More boys will be lost in the school system, ending with more men lost in life, among other things. All there will be is naked survival, and to be frank, I think we might be there already. We need to stop being afraid, for what we do and say will never have the rubber stamp of approval of the masses. It's part of what it means to go your own way. Without acknowledging what must be acknowledged is a day that further contributes to our destruction. The time for pretense is over. You know, men and women being so different from each other in many respects need to ask themselves if they wish to further their understanding of our species as a whole. What are the innate fears of the human male and of the human female? And I'll attempt to address those of the male here in this video, or at least some of them. I believe that we have a fear, a deep-seated fear as men, that women do not love us in a way that we love them, that they do not care about us, and they do not see us as full human beings in the way that men define humanity. And I believe that this is why men are so intent on erecting a facade around those fears, a facade that is currently being wielded against men with devastating efficiency. And this is why I believe wholeheartedly not a single prevailing gynocentric cultural norm will shift until men, men, understand that this is about how men and women view each other until men start, and you know, here's the evil word, generalizing women, until men start expecting this behavior from women. Until men start treating women as though, unfortunately, they have to expect a certain level of predation from them. Whether that predation is conscious or not, things will not change until men start looking out for themselves and for themselves first and foremost, even if women are negatively impacted by doing so. Nothing's gonna change until men realize that they are alone, nothing will change. Your laws are impotent to stop this, and the men's movement is impotent to stop this until that occurs. Again, I mentioned that human beings are horrified more than anything else by horrific possibility. It's, it's the what-ifs that bother us most, and the great horrific possibility that terrifies men is that women don't love us and almost never affirm and recognize our humanity, 
and that terrifies men down to their very core. And we will gladly endure any kind of objectification and humiliation to cover that up. There's a place called Dementia Village. And this is a place where people with uh, degenerative mental illnesses, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's and the like, this is a place where they're allowed to live life in a self-contained neighborhood, you know, with supermarkets and chances for employment and all of the opportunities that a life in the real world would provide to them. The only problem is that there's a very real question of whether or not this is in fact an ethical way to treat these people, because the catch is that these patients have no idea that the world they live in, this dementia village, is completely fictional and isolated from the real world and therefore isolated from reality itself. The patients are under the illusion that they're living their lives in the general population but are in fact isolated and in ignorance of the true nature of their reality and so is it ethical to lie by omission to these people to make them believe they're leading full normal lives when in fact they're essentially unwitting participants in a social experiment designed to further our understandings of dementia. The interesting part of all this is that the patients in this dementia village on average report a greater quality of life and happiness and live longer than their counterparts that know they're being institutionalized. And upon hearing about this dementia village, my first instinct was, you know, you know, to pity these people. But then I started realizing that men, men at large are these people. Better yet, men at large are in a worse situation than these patients. And I reached that conclusion when I realized that given the artificial nature of Dementia Village, these patients probably still retain their own self-interest, and you'd probably have a hard time coaxing them to harm themselves for the benefit of others. Men live in a world where they can be readily coaxed to proudly go down on a sinking ship to their deaths for women that have never and will never care about them. We live in a world where men can and do repeatedly enter into the marriage contract knowing that it can rob them of their financial and emotional wealth, and they still choose to do it. And they still choose to sign up for bullshit wars where women don't have to. And they do this over and over and over again. And the famous quote comes to mind that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. And this is when I realized just who really are the ones living in Dementia Village. It's men. It's us. We fear the horrific possibility of women viewing us more as tools than as human beings so much that we've erected our, our very own dementia village and taken up residence and stubbornly refused to get out and now we don't even remember that there was a way out in the first place. We've talked about love before and how it's not simply an unsubstantiated claim to say that the feeling of love is quite similar to the feelings of, you know, insanity or schizophrenia. Uh, you know, we've after all cited studies here about the serotonin levels of those in love very closely resembling the levels of those who suffer from uh, obsessive compulsive disorders. The fresh-faced young male is incapable of seeing that the matrix of romantic love, its flawlessness, its, its euphoric perfection, can only be matched, oppositely of course, but matched indeed by the misery of its collapse, its utter and definitive collapse. You know, the desolation that men experience after divorces and, and long-term breakups, now that they don't have that all-pervasive, all-encompassing her to wrap their identity around, that matrix to wrap their identity around, the depths of depression that ensue for a great many men have no limits to the point that many of these men cannot bear it and kill themselves, deciding instead to end their suffering instead of conquering it. And I suspect that the men that actually do end up killing themselves after divorces are men that, that do not understand, that don't have access to the information, that do not understand the biology behind exactly what it is they're feeling. And those suffering from withdrawal, while they can and have and will continue to die from it, we have a vaccine, gentlemen. That's what the red pill is. We've developed an inoculation. We have an inoculation to stave off the powerful effects of withdrawal from whatever female you have personally decided to unwittingly or even wittingly deify. And, and, and of course, this is no easy task. There's a tsunami to be held back in doing so. Or maybe the better way of phrasing it is that there's a biological coping mechanism to subvert. The human male is in a constant struggle between his rational mind and his lizard brain, as we all know. And it only takes a moment of weakness to succumb and in some cases, as we all know, men who can't handle the heartbreak or the deprivation of their children or the financial ruin, they succumb permanently. And so, so this is not a joking matter, gentlemen. You know, it may sound ridiculous to some, but the gravity of our need to conquer the serpent can become readily apparent when it's you or when it's your brother or when it's your father or even your son in the throes of addictive romantic withdrawal. The plain fact is, gentlemen, that not all of us are strong enough to sustain the psychological blow that is the collapse of a long-term relationship due to unrequited love. The whole non-platonic romantic love thing is basically based on pure blind optimism. It's the blind optimism that produces the feelings of giddiness and, of course, the idealization and pedestalization of the female that us men do in the early stages of romantic love. 
and it's those giddy feelings and idealizations of women that make us pure putty in their hands. Women use these feelings of ours to completely manipulate this, and when us males allow ourselves to succumb to these highly false feelings of love, then we give all the power to the female in the relationship, and thus make ourselves highly vulnerable to women's totally ruthless and capricious nature. We basically hand over custody of our emotional and financial health to a female whom we really don't know very well, with absolutely no guarantee that the female will be benevolently disposed towards us. In fact, there's a high probability, given women's ruthless and calculating and capricious nature, that the female will be malevolently disposed towards us, and that she will abuse the immense power we've handed over to her to our severe detriment by cuckolding us, fucking us over financially, continually putting us down, etc., etc. It's the men who almost always invest more both emotionally and financially in the relationship. It's the men who usually get far more carried away. It's the men who do the idealization and the pedestalization, not the other way around. It's usually the men who completely emotionally commit themselves to the relationship, a byproduct of having naively idealized and pedestalized the female. How often do women pedestalize and idealize romantic partners? Hardly ever. Rather, right from the start of the relationship, the females tend to be in more control than the men, they don't idealize the male, rather, right from the start of the relationship, they view the relationship in cold, hard, transactional terms. The females view the male as just another cock or another wallet, i.e. disposable, dispensable, and replaceable, and at pretty short notice, too, particularly when she perceives the male doesn't, quote, measure up to her entitlement complex and to her demands. It's because women view non-platonic relationships in transactional terms that they don't generally commit emotionally in the relationship anything like as much as the men. And it's for this reason that they also tend to be much more aware of their options throughout relationships than males are, who by comparison in their minds have committed themselves 100% to the female in question. So really, we have a state of affairs in non-platonic relationships where the male tends to view the relationship in idealized emotional terms, whereas the woman is looking at it in transactional consumerist terms, and men will tend to look at the relationship as a whole that is greater than some of its parts, whereas women aren't looking at, at the whole, rather they're looking at it from a what's in it for me point of view. It's for all these reasons that men tend to fall far harder when non-platonic relationships go wrong, and indeed why male suicide rates are far, far higher in the aftermath of failed non-platonic relationships compared to those of females, and it explains why women tend to emotionally recover from failed relationships far quicker than men from day one, they never had idealized their partner or their relationship, and from day one, they had only ever been in a relationship to see what they could get from a relationship on a selfish basis. What we're experiencing is, in fact, a social and economic war between men, women, and the state where, quite frankly, women and the state are dominating due to coinciding interests. Uh, you know, I liken it not to a conscious struggle where either the state, men, and women are consciously or explicitly stating one or the other to be the enemy of either of these three parties, but to the relationship, perhaps, uh, between a military commander and his soldiers, uh, the mechanics of which are not explained by the contemporary position that the Manosphere has chosen to adopt. Our entire Western society, in fact, top-down, bottom-up, whichever way you choose to assess it, is under a non-stop, robust propaganda campaign and here in America, this propaganda campaign manifests itself as a, you know, support the troops no matter how ass-backward the war is kind of one-upsmanship, where people who don't understand the true meaning of patriotism compete for who can think up the most flattering and oppositely but equally disingenuous things to say to men in uniform. You know, we say the, the fake, empty, Hallmark card asks, thank you for serving, and, you know, I appreciate everything you do for our country, and, and so on and so forth. And it's all just a, a facade, of course. Because how many of these people are willing to welcome some, you know, PTSD uh, male homeless veteran into their home? Right? How many of these people want some homeless uh, 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 Iraq or Vietnam veteran camping out on their futon while he reintegrates back into society? All of this fake uh, military worship, it, it's, it's all for troop morale. It's all to show the current wave of young men offering up their bodies as weapons of war that they're uh, appreciated even though they're really not. Uh, we know that in World War I and, and in Iraq and in World War II and really all wars uh, that have ever elapsed uh, in any large number. This little scene has played out in one form or another. The battle-hardened veteran trying to shield the rookies uh, from, from the true nature of warfare. 
It's the glorification of war. It's the obfuscation of the reality of war. And you gotta ask yourself, why would he hide the size and scope of the military casualties and deaths these soldiers were walking into? Because surely when they're no longer green and they lose friends to bullets and bombs on the front lines, maybe right in front of them, uh, while they're watching, uh, the gravity of their situation was gonna sink in real quick. So why hide that reality from them? Why not warn them? Well, you know, for the same reason that it was illegal for so long to film the flag draped coffins of Americans killed in action returning from Iraq, it's troop morale, it's unit cohesion. There is a symbiotic, mutually exploitative relationship between military commander and, and his soldiers. And the mass psychology of, of poor troop morale triggers desertion sometimes on a massive scale, which is why Joseph Stalin ordered his soldiers to kill deserters on sight. An American arrest for desertion during World War II exceeded uh, like 40,000. The right isolated act of breakdown in unit cohesion can lead to a catastrophic breakdown in troop morale and cause soldiers to go AWOL on a massive scale. And the whole point of me addressing this is that, again, I compare the current state of affairs between men and women to be a gender war in the sense that women are mercenary soldiers, they're willing to fight for whoever seems to be the most capable leader, whoever they think is going to give them the spoils of war, and men are their own separate army, and so is the state. And the state has been launching attack after attack on men, successfully acquiring our own war supplies through their taxation, and women, by and large, provide the votes necessary for the state to leverage this taxation. Their loyalty, uh, women's loyalty, lies with men so long as they can benefit from it, much like a military only trusts their commander as long as they think he will lead them to victory and will turn on him the moment they feel he's no longer competent in doing so. And so men, they refuse to fight women who are acting in service to the state by and large. Now, is this a conviction of any one individual woman? Absolutely not. But we are in a state of warfare here, and unfortunately, most women are just not on our side. I wish this wasn't the case, but they either passively acquiesce or actively act against us in the vast majority of cases. And frankly, the only way they're going to learn is if men show them that they aren't going to take it anymore. That's going to take men on the streets demanding that we do something about the state of homelessness in our country. And, 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 and indeed, in, throughout the world, because the majority of homeless are men. Men are going to have to start looking out for their own interests because, and, and this is key here, nobody else will. And the fact that the vast majority of homeless are men proves that what I'm saying is correct here. Women used to fight alongside men against nature and the elements because the net gain was protection and provision and a civilization that men, whom they perceived as competent military generals against the forces of nature, would carve out for them. That was the spoils of our war to tame nature that women wanted a piece of, and now that that war is over, a great many women see us more as a redundant nuisance instead of human beings that are just as deserving of a place in the civilization that we built as they are. And the worst part about it is that most of this is unconscious, it's rooted in biology, and this is the situation we're in. At no point does this imply that men should hold some kind of an H hatred towards women, it simply sorts out the state of affairs, the state of war, between these three parties that make up humanity. Saying that there exists a gender war is as indicative of a so-called hatred of women as saying that there exists a constant power struggle between a military leader and his troops is indicative of a hatred of Napoleon or Caesar or MacArthur or Hitler or Stalin or whoever. So if the term gender war rubs you the wrong way, then use gender conflict or gender struggle or whatever. But to ignore the current state of affairs is disastrous for men, and if we keep believing that women are these har harmonious angels, corrupted by Sauron's pervading influence, the all-seeing eye of feminism and all that nonsense, then we will continue, continue to be dispatched with ease. Our efforts to change the legal climate will be laughed at. Our efforts to demand society treat men as human beings will be laughed at. These efforts will reek of impotency. They will reek of ineffectiveness. And of course, if you've learned anything about women, they don't respect that. Greetings. I'm going to call this a MGTOW stream of consciousness. Now, of course, I always do this sort of thing. This is off the cuff. Not always, but very often. MGTOW as a concept, I'm not going to call it a movement, as a concept, is composed of a very disparate group of people. And that's why it's even more difficult to make a prediction of the future. You know, what is MGTOW going to become? What's going to happen? And so on and so forth. This just seems, 
it seems almost folly to, to even attempt to make a prediction with regards to that as anything other than what I've already said. That is to say, you know, there'll be more growth, there'll be more, you know, internet blogs and people making videos and what have you. Uh, you know, I know, you know, I know how things are marketed. I know that cheap, accessible, ubiquitous is what people like and they lap up. I also know that people grasp the easy stuff, frankly, a lot more easily, well, obviously. Um, and th that's always what's going to be popular. I know that's just the way it is. I mean, you know, don't get married, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And you can make lots of videos about that and videos about you know, the intricacies of, of dating as a MGTOW. And okay, that's great. And I know it's popular and appeals to the broad masses of men. You know, we as an online community suffer from all the deficiencies that any other community might. I mean, we, let's face it, as I said, we have the same issues in the sense that when people make an effort to go beyond the basics, um, it's, I mean, it's just not as appealing to most people. And even though I personally think it'll get to this later, that any topic that involves human understanding of the world we live in, the universe, or what have you, uh, that that's really uh, part of MGTOW. That's the, almost a definition of MGTOW. And every time Barbarossa, or I for that matter, have made a video that's o only tangentially related to MGTOW, or not really related, at least in a direct sense that people can relate to, they tend to be a lot less popular repackaging the same message over and over again as an easy sell, that's, that makes you popular, one, um, and it sells well and it spreads the basics of the message. Okay. And so to answer your question, that's what we're, we're going to see more of. We're going to see more channels talking about the same stuff that's been talked about a lot. And some, some men clearly have not yet been exposed to that and they're not aware of that. And, and that's, that's good because that means they're going to get exposed to that. But uh, I have a, a deep yearning to go f beyond that, uh, as you know. Uh, maybe because I've spent a lot of time myself talking about the basics. Um, and we're so different. I mean, we're all very different. Think about the reasons why we choose to go our own way. It seems almost uniform. The, the only thing I think that might be uniform is you're not getting married. But then again... I think most MGTOW would have gotten married, and I'm someone who, who never wanted to get married from the get-go, uh, and uh, never interested me as a, as a concept. I couldn't really understand why people were bothering to it long before I understood the, the dangers of divorce. I just, why would I ever get married? Um, I never really wanted to be a provider. I'm not a, a fixer-upper. I don't drive. Never interested me. I look all these, I'm, I'm just I'm an atypical male. I think in, in some ways that's why MGTOW suits me as a concept. Um, and everyone has different reasons for going their own way. And then even even in its uh, in its actual expression, MGTOW takes on different forms. I mean, look at well let let's take I mean, I consider Barbaros a friend, even though it's been eons since we talked. Uh, you know, he's a MGTOW that, you know, dates and goes and, and, and is involved in a relationship. And, you know, that's that's one version of it, and then you get I'm I'm the, the kind of more monkish version. Uh, and so there's you get all these kinds of all all this all these kinds of variants, and so there's there's just no way to go. And moreover, we're not really connected to each other in any way. I mean, we're not conversing on a even a weekly basis. We're not engaged in dialogue. We're not uh, so we're not in doing meetups. Some of you might remember this is way back in the day. When I was a beginner, and you know, Barbaros has been around forever, so he, you know, he was well before me. You know, that Barbaros suggested that you know men start spreading knowledge uh, amongst each other. If you cannot go indefinitely without sex, you know, there's a problem. I want to repeat that and refine that. And this is my own personal view. It's going to conflict with other views. Is that the one blow job away mentality comes from the narcotic like addiction to to sex? as well as this male mother need, which is often all bound up with that. It's sort of tied, it's sort of spaghettied together. And let's face it, men by their very natures are sex addicts. 
And most men cannot go indefinitely without sex. And by that, I, I don't mean that, you know, there's some <laughs> men can't go forever without having sex. It was the, they will yearn for it. The ones who aren't getting laid want to get laid and so on and so forth. They're not taking that, they're not looking at it from a, a position of indifference. It's how we got into the situation with Elliot Rogers, as I talked about. There is a, a religious, almost ethereal appeal to the sex act. And of course, you know, this, this joining. Uh, I think men, deep down, think more about some sort of, than women do, mind you, the, some sort of mystical joining that takes place when you stick your penile organ in the vaginal orifice or whichever other orifices you choose to. I've never been a fan of anal sex myself, but whatever floats your boat. Um, you know, and, and some mystic thing happens. I mean, and some men can separate that. But even, I mean, here's the deal. It's because of the sex addiction, in my humble opinion, that most men, even going, most men going their own way, will always be in that position of one blowjob away. And it takes a mighty strong will. I mean, I think it, it, w it would take a, a sort of a mass of, of Barbarossas. I mean, Barbarossa, as I said, he's someone who's in, who engages in relationships, but he can cut it off. You know, he enjoys it for what it is, and he can cut it off. I don't know if most men can do that. I don't think they can. Um, that's my uh, personal assessment of it. On the other extreme end, <laughs> yeah. what if, if then, if everyone were like Stardust, and I'm not praising myself in this regard, I'm just giving you a, a description of my behavior within the MGTOW sphere, had an attitude such, such as myself in, in large numbers, it would be significantly more threatening than just men not getting married. I mean, I'm a guy who cannot be tempted with sex, uh, no matter how hot the girl is. Um, because I always think of the trade-offs. I think about the potential problems that arise from it. I think about uh, I think about the effort that that is required that's required for it. As I say in French, n'importe quoi, which is a stronger form of of whatever. It's you know. So I think one thing that could be done is that men learn to tame their inner beasts. This is not me being prude or conservative in this sense. It's me, it's, I mean, sex is fun sometimes. Yeah, most, I mean, you have to be lucky to actually get a good partner. But how do, how do I quench my male mother need? I recognize its futility. I recognize it as, as, as a wish that cannot be fulfilled. A kind of, a kind of wishing for God, if you will. It's, it's just, which is never something I've ever wished for. But it, it just, I, I, it's, the male mother need is just this, something that cannot be sated it's insatiable and there's no point even giving it any thought that's how i quench it and when you when you do think you have that it's just a simulation it's a simulation that you're paying for usually with your labor or your time or both or your money or any combination of these things and it's a simulation that will wear off that will be turned off the minute you fuck up and make a mistake that said female uses a mistake and then says, well, I'm not going to bother with this anymore. Women know, as Barbara also said, wants to you know, turn, they know thanks to their biology how to turn their dials and the switches. I don't even think about it. I just don't, I don't think. Whatever yearning I had years ago, this has been extinguished and it should be if you want to go your own way. There you should, I, in my, in my, this is all just my opinion. It's a stardust opinion. If you want to you know, master the path. If, if, if real change were to come about, assuming sufficient numbers, you have to master the inner beast. You have to be, you have to be, I think, indifferent to sex, which is not the same thing as rejecting it wholesale. I don't reject sex. It's just, I'm not going to put any effort in to get it, which might sound like rejection, but it's not. Because if some hot chick just, you know, rang my doorbell and said, you know, I want to suck your dick and and you should fuck me, and then she just left and disappeared forever. I do that. It doesn't require much effort. But that doesn't usually happen. So what is one key characteristic of, of the human male? I mean, we want to understand things. You know, we, we, we don't just accept things on, on, on 
at face. We don't just say, oh, well, everyone else is doing it, let's go along with that. That's what women do, the Borg consensus, you know, maintaining that deceptive image, that illusory image of cooperation and harmony just for the sake of it because, you know, the gods know we don't want to not get along. And that's, the, I mean, so we want, we're, we're independent by nature, men. We're differentiated, and we want to understand the world, albeit in many different, you know, ways. I've never been the kind of guy who's wanted to understand uh, the inner workings of a car, even though I think I have a basic knowledge by now. Uh, I never was interested in learning how to drive, uh, partly in large measure because my mind tends to wander. I've always wanted to understand the world, and I think that primarily is why I'm so drawn to MGTOW, because it's been a quest for understanding above all else. Not just, you know, we're going on strike the marriage, since I've never given a fuck about marriage anyway, but trying to understand all these different facets of the world. Of course we can't be interested in everything. You know? I'm not, I'm interested in a lot of things, but not in everything. I told you, I'm, I'm not terribly interested in chemistry, biochemistry more so, and I know I could put most of you guys to sleep with the stuff I could talk about with language, which I try to refrain from, since most people don't give a shit about that. I, you know, I find grammar and things like that just fascinating, but try and understand the world. That is, that is the MGTOW quest. Remember what I said in my escape philosophy video. Women have assigned no value to intelligence, but for that which it can give them in material goods and resources. A woman who says, oh, I like an intelligent man, all she's, that's just code for saying, I like a man who's smart enough to make money and do stuff. What if a boy's lifelong passion became geometry and he comes up with his own theorems, but he's kind of stuck between a thirty and $50,000 salary for the rest of his life? He's not ambitious, of course not. He's just trying to understand the intricacies of the geometric universe, but hey, He's not ambitious. So that's another aspect of MGTOW. It's redefining things on your own terms. That's what, what, what men should do. They should do whatever they want to do. I've been my entire life, quote-unquote, unambitious. Uh, I never understood, and I'm going back to look at my previous video on semantics, I think so could relate, rather, to people when I was an undergraduate who were just studying business and, these thing, and, and medicine pre-med, they had no interest in biology, really, no interest in medicine, uh, in business or finance. They just knew it would be lucrative and, and, and remunerative, and I just didn't understand it. I knew there would be pro probably be consequences, financial consequences for what I was studying. And so, but even knowing that, my desire to understand the things I wanted to understand at the time was too strong to just drop them and then study something uh, that, I didn't want, had no interest in and didn't want to study at all to begin with, uh, which has always been a hallmark of Stardust. I don't do things well that I'm not interested in. Um, it's one of the reasons I don't, I don't want to drive. I would be a danger to you and the rest of the world. No interest in driving. Just one example. So redefining things on, on MGTOW terms, whatever terms individual men choose, I mean, that's, you know. So getting back to that point, you know, that guy said I was unambitious because I'm not busting my ass in some office trying to make money and climb the corporate ladder or whatever. But I sit at home quietly trying to understand stuff uh, that a lot of people wouldn't, except for specialists. But those specialists might not even be making lots of money. I and mean, people study uh, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, for example. They're not making lots of money. As for myself, most likely, assuming my health holds and all the rest of that lovely stuff, uh, I'll just continue my quest for understanding. For myself, yeah, I'm just going to try to keep on understanding and, and making videos uh, towards that end with a view towards understanding the world. And yeah, I, I, I go on record as saying it's unfortunate that you know we as MGTOW cannot explore other concepts that I consider part of MGTOW that aren't related to dating women and all this crap that's just not interesting. Um, exploring the world and trying to understand it, for me, it, that, that's MGTOW. It's not just, oh, I'm not going to get married because the system is unfair and I could get a girl knocked up. That's almost just common sense by now. So yeah, I'll be 
continuing my thing. Uh, my next video, whenever I get that done, will not will be just tangentially related to MGTOW, but I think it's a fascinating topic. Uh, intricately related to the escape velocity uh, video in many ways and uh, the chimeras of meaning. I've mentioned that before, so we'll see. Anyway, I think I've said my piece for now. This was totally stream of consciousness, it's, it's, hence the title. So I'll leave it off for here. With any luck, may we speak again soon. Take care. Stop doing favors for women. Stop in every way doing any favors for women. Now, I help people, and uh, I believe that helping people is, is good. But stop helping women. Stop doing any favors for them. Do not help them in any way. Now, I realize that's a pretty generalizing statement. However, we live in a society that generalizes men every single day to their detriment, so stop helping women. Which women should you stop helping specifically? Any women who thinks she's entitled to having her cake and eating it too. Which, by the way, are the majority of the women in America today. Women don't need our help. They have enough help as it is. Our entire society is designed to create exactly the kind of man who cannot resist his desire for sex and will do anything a woman wants him to do to get it. This helps women. A sprawling network of domestic violence shelters open up their doors to women every day but not one of these have the common decency to shelter men, even though women and men commit domestic violence at roughly the same rates, and this helps women. Massive bureaucracies are set up, as well as affirmative action laws designed to ensure that women get the job by any means necessary, and once they do get the job, they have to be treated with kitten gloves just to keep them from filing bogus sexual harassment suits. When you live in a society where women can falsely accuse men of rape, and when it comes out that they're only trying to avoid being exposed as the bottom of the barrel scumbag whores that they are, as seen in the Hofstra and Duke Lacrosse incidents, and then it comes out that these women don't spend any time in jail for their crimes, the concept of the pussy pass begins to show itself in all its hypocritical splendor. So let me ask you this. If women are getting away with falsely accusing men of rape, with nothing more than slaps on the wrist, what exactly gives you the idea that they aren't applying the same type of behavior in the workplace? The pussy pass helps women. Our entire society helps women and, and neglects and restricts men, which is why I am angry. Which brings me to my next point. I, I, I got a lot of comments on my latest video titled, How Women Destroy Men. And these comments were asking if, or implying that I'm angry. So I'm going to address this right now. Is, uh, is Barbarossa angry? Uh, at the moment, no. But is there a general trend in me that I've noticed that I'm more and more angry these days? Well, yes. Yeah, I'm angry. I'm angry that the moment I start giving truthful and accurate depictions of the state of affairs in Western feminist matriarchy, I'm labeled as angry. And more importantly, I'm angry at the state of affairs in Western feminist matriarchy. My question to you is why shouldn't I be? If you must know about my exploits with women, I'll have you know that it's never been a problem of getting a woman. My problem always has been, and still is, a lack of desire to sift through the staggering amount of loose, sex-crazed, alcoholic, STD-ridden, manipulative, ecstasy-popping, poor excuses for women that constitute the totality of women around me in order to find a decent woman who doesn't fail as a woman in every sense of the word. My so-called anger stems from the fact that when I accurately postulate that for every openly loose whore out there, there are six or seven females of the same phylum that are moonlighting and masquerading as decent wholesome women, and I'm then accused of messing with the wrong women. But what you don't understand is that every hoe is not immediately detectable. You have to put some of these frauds through rigorous testing before their true nature is revealed. And then, and only then, after you put in some of your precious time does the nature of the beast truly become apparent. These insidious chameleons want desperately for men like me, baby mamalists, 
healthy, disciplined, determined men like me to not see them for what they are and employ every trick in their arsenal to get men like me to believe that they're worthy of one day bearing my children or being my wife. They hate that more and more men, especially ones with bright futures ahead of, ahead of them, are not falling for the trap. The Western whore, which I have, in, have, have entitled the real swine flu epidemic, is starting to panic because a vaccine has been administered. And like any good virus, the Western whore is mutating and using its groupthink and herd hive mentality to make it harder for them to be identified. And so we have a new strain emerging. Gone is the bra burning, displaying her whoredom for everyone to see feminista today. We have millions and millions of cubic zirconias who position themselves around the diamonds and it is very hard to tell the difference upon initial inspection. And so yes, yes, I'm angry. Because for all of your empowerment and all of your freedom and all of your independence, you whores are still too weak to actually show what you are. You despise women who are family oriented, who aren't loose, who can actually produce a home cooked meal without the use of a microwave. Yet when it comes to how you want men to see you, you desperately, desperately try to get us to believe that you are these women. You claim to be as competent and as able as men, but the moment some shit hits the fan, you want to be equal to children and expect the men to stay on a sinking ship while you get saved along with the children. Your independence, your breaking of gender roles, your freedom is all apparent, but if it means that you might lose your life, you're happy to regress back to childhood and let the men sacrifice themselves for you. You love to go out and sleep with five 10, 20, 30, 50 men and you want to reform yourself out of nowhere when you're done doing that and you want us to pretend that you haven't had X amount of men run through you. So yeah, I'm angry. And, and I'm going to say this. You won't trap me. You will not trap me. I will not be duped. I will not be outsmarted. You are not my equal. I've spotted your playing field and memorized your playbook. I am one of the few who understand that 90% of your success, Western whore, relies upon the assumption of your innocence and the element of surprise. I understand that you depend on your prey never knowing that they're in your crosshairs. And I know that you don't snipe so well when you're worrying about getting sniped back yourself. Remember, Western whore, that I know that the main reason you usually win the game is because most men assume that there isn't a game being played. But I promise you, that I'll expose you every chance I get. Every man that I meet is getting the crash course if he's willing to listen. So yeah. In conclusion. I'm pretty damn angry. But no. I'm not going to use my anger. F for violence. I'm not going to use my anger. To hurt anybody. I'm just going to use it as motivation. Nyani is a biological phenomenon, simply defined as the retention or prolongation of traits in adults that are normally associated with children. Nyani is extremely prevalent in the human female. Over time and uncounted generations, evolution selected for Nyatnis features in the human female because, for whatever reason, human males express their preference for Nyatnis females in offering their labor provision and resources to this group, as opposed to females with fewer neotenous features, and mating with them, thus providing increased chances of greater neoteny in female offspring, and raising highly neotenous features to be a standard that is now effectively the standard across the globe, irrespective of culture or country when it comes to the preferences of men in choosing mates. Since neoteny on its own is a purely biological phenomenon, it will likely have given birth to social phenomena related to it, inasmuch as a biological phenomenon is the precursor to a social and cultural phenomenon by dint of simple precedence. We are also aware of hypoagency, a term I coined a while back to describe women's seeming unwillingness or inability to affect changes upon the world directly, often working through proxy agents, i.e. men. Hypoagency is also clearly a derivative of selective pressures in the past when the environment our ancestors lived in 
was radically different to the current one. And the average male's superior strength, as an example, put him in what was essentially a caretaker role to the female. And because we had lived in such a harsh environment that likely required such a setup for far longer than the current one of comfort extraordinaire, this phenomenon of hypoagency has become ingrained in the human psyche, both in, fe in the female, uh, in her perception of herself, and male perception of women. Men had, for millennia, been exposed to constant stress, duress, and violent death. And women had been, to the extent that it was possible, spared of most of that. And unsurprisingly, this pattern continues today, since we are all still running on 20,000-year-old software. You often see comments along the lines of women essentially being adult children. And given the verifiable facts of physiological neoteny, as well as the psychologically and behaviorally observable hypoagency, there seems to be something to this. If women have evolved to have juvenile features, and men prefer this, and women are protected to a greater extent from the ravages of life by those self-same men, having been taken care of for the most part in the past, it stands to reason that mentally a great portion of women have remained, psychologically speaking, in certain respects in, a, in an arrested state of development in their behavior, a behavior which can readily be likened to that of a child. And quoting Girl Writes What from her video, to which this video is a response, quote, when you act like a child, people see you as a child, end quote. There seems to me to exist a rather nefarious synergy between neoteny and hypoagency, both feeding into each other and further cementing what results from that synergy. And generally speaking, we as a collective seek to help women, rendering them aid as needed, just as we seek to protect them from the ills of the world, certainly from violent death. And we generally wish to make their lives easier. On a microcosmic scale, we see this in the day-to-day -day interactions of both men and women, displaying their favoritism towards women. And in many countries, the state itself has become a proxy father-slash-provider partner for women, wherein men's hard-earned resources are siphoned away from them to provide for women's needs and wants, no matter how unwarranted these might be. The issue that, in my observation, I would classify as most grave, resulting from this nefarious coupling of neoteny and hypoagency, is the manifestation of solipsism in the female what I oftentimes, in more pedestrian terms, call the me syndrome. And children, especially infants and very young children, are necessarily solipsistic in their perceptions, in large measure because their very existence is dependent upon others and their needs being met by others, lest they perish. And since they lack the ability to provide for themselves, the screaming infant, lacking agency, must be solipsistic in order to survive, and the respective parent can countenance that solipsism or not. More often than not, he or she does, since parents wish that their progeny survive to reproduce themselves. Now, I'm not going to claim to be in possession of the knowledge of what exactly a baby sees or perceives, and what it desires for that matter, but it is safe to make the assumption that the self is the primary mode of perception and operation, meaning that to the extent that others do exist for a child, for a baby, they exist to service its needs, be it hunger, wanting a toy, having nappies changed, etc. This can only be called a solipsistic worldview. Part of the process of growing up and becoming an adult is the acknowledgement of the existence of others within a social environment as independent entities. The independent entities have their own interests and drives, which may or may not coincide with those of the maturing individual. To reach a state of being wherein the separation of being is both acknowledged internally and externally, something observable through behavior, is to have reached essentially what one might call a state of adulthood. A person who continues with a childlike, i.e. solipsistic worldview is one that adulthood has eluded 
for whom others continue to exist only as extensions of its desires, or rather to service those desires. Behold the human female, a creature we factually know to physiologically resemble a child, and through the derivative hypoagency, indeed, act oftentimes much like a child. Children are not endowed with a sense of responsibility. This must be learnt and acquired. And responsibility to others can only be acquired if otherhood itself is something that has legitimately been acknowledged. If many women are essentially children, then solipsism should be readily observable in a similar fashion to children in female behavior, and I believe it is. Consider female entitlement. Children feel entitled because all they know are their needs and wants. They know no differently, and unfortunately in many cases the same can be said of women. Looking at the many instances of false rape accusations whereby the female falsely claims a man has raped her, and the consequences that those accusations bring about, we can see this in play. In the case of Brian Banks, his female accuser sought to gain vast money through a lawsuit against the school district where the alleged rape took place. Never mind her slight resentment, uh, or less than slight resentment, at allegedly being snubbed by Brian. And Brian was just a tool in the service of her desires, and the fact that Winetta Gibson went through, it, went through with it shows quite clearly that Brian's otherhood was not acknowledged. The disgruntled wife, who divorces on a whim, demanding payment from the hard-working husband, taking his children away is no different because neither the husband nor the children are independent entities. Indeed, how often do we hear women speak in almost symbiotic terms of the child growing in their wombs? The husband owes her the money because that is what she wants. The children are extensions of herself, and thus there is no question of custody. And neither is it different in the case of the female who maintains a quote-unquote serious relationship with one man who provides her with financial services and gifts and simultaneously keeps a lover on the side to service her sexual needs. A person possessed of a solipsistic worldview does not need to justify or rationalize any of this since everything outside the self is there to serve the self as is the case with a child. Remorse, regret, guilt and these feelings are foreign, and wrongdoing can easily be broken down into the simplistic formula of, quote, does it make me feel good or does it not, end quote. At the same time, since parents generally bend over backwards to service the needs of the solipsistic child, so too does the modern state service the needs of its children, namely women. From rape shield laws to job and education quotas, when a woman wants something, the state gives it to her almost reflexively, in a manner little different to the way most men bend over backwards to satisfy the needs of the dissatisfied children, the satisfied children they call girlfriends and wives. Of course, there are differences between infant solipsism and adult female solipsism, as children usually only have simplistic needs that are easily met. Food, for example. The nefarious melding of neoteny and hypoagency, on the other hand, in a woman child, expands those needs astronomically, since the child is part adult as well. And since all of this is wrapped up in the most atavistic and primal aspects of the human condition, both in what women are and how the world, specifically the world of men, accommodates them in how they are, there is unfortunately no end in sight. Under normal circumstances, children grow up, but this maturation does not seem likely to take place since women in their actions and men in their reactions to those actions uh, find themselves in an arrested state of development. Neither a bright present nor a bright future, since the future only promises more of the same. Unfortunate. Thanks for watching. The following is a graph of suicides of both males and females between the ages of 15 and 24 from 1900 to 2006. Now the data for this graph was compiled by Tom Mortensen from the Pell Institute for the Study of Opportunity in Higher Education and I originally came across it uh, via MRA Red 660s blog. 
which is in the link box, uh, but also through a PDF that Tom Mortensen has posted on the internet titled, What's Wrong with the Boys, uh, which is also in the description box. Now in this PDF, he gives various findings in regards to men and boys faltering in the school systems and in the job markets, uh, as well as the suicide data given here. And his email and phone number is given for those that wish to talk personally with him as a source. That said, uh, if we are to believe the accuracy of this graph, and, and I do, then we have to take notice, of course, of the dramatic spike in suicide rates of males around the 1965 mark. Before we do that, though, uh, let's ask ourselves, what is suicide? To me, it's a human being suffering tremendously, making one final statement to the world before leaving it forever, at least in the physical sense. And since none of us knows exactly what lies beyond that, we have to assume that people that commit suicide do so with the full knowledge that the act itself will possibly relinquish some of their consciousness forever. Now that realization alone is pretty profound if you ask me, uh, and as someone with an intense interest in trying to speculate what runs through the minds of people during times of extreme duress, I came to the stark conclusion that the moments leading up to a person's suicide and the loneliness they have to feel is as far as I'm concerned one of the most terrifying things I've ever tried to conceptualize. And I was keeping that thought in mind when it became obvious that the near exponential spike in the number of male suicide at about 1965 is a clear reaction to feminism and the disenfranchisement of men that followed afterwards. Now what I want to highlight is the very real damage done by giving men the false impression that things will be different for them. That although marriages were just starting to fall apart and women were beginning to steal what men work for illegally with permission from the state, that if he managed to do everything right, if he worked hard enough, if he was enough of a gentleman, then he would be rewarded with that one girl that was different and special and loyal and whatever other fairy tale fantasy character trait men seem determined to see in women. Understand, when looking at this graph, that those blue dots uh, represent tens of thousands of male lies that were told ridiculous, ineffective, and outright damaging lies about how it was up to them to just meet the right woman, about how marriage is, quote, a lot of hard work but it's so worth it, and various other phrases of nondescript and ineffective nonsense that didn't actually help them understand the dynamics between men and women when the feminist changes that the 60s ushered in were in its infancy. This was the kind of euphemistic crap that was given to men while women were gaining legal power over men that allowed them to legally steal their children and wealth in the court systems. How many of those blue dots represent the life of a man that was enslaved by a woman he thought loved him in the court system? How many men were raised to pursue this sacred partnership between men and women that dissolved into nothing more than a collective backstabbing on the part of women the very moment they were convinced that they didn't need men anymore? We can no longer afford to tell men this. You know, at this point, the well-being of our young men and boys is at stake here because as evidenced by this graph, we see that men and boys will believe these lies and when women prove themselves to be hypergamous and self-interested, men will not be able to handle it and many will die at their own hands. This isn't about hating women, it's about being honest to men. Women are not your partners, they never have been. They are the other half of your species, that's all. They are biologically equipped both physically and mentally to extract resources from men, and men have a very real handicap in the form of various chemical processes in the brain that make it easier for women to do this. And if we're not careful, men will believe a very dangerous and very inaccurate mythos about the opposite sex that will destroy them when the sobering realities of divorce courts spell it out for them in the most emotionally and financially draining way possible that Briffold's law is real and that the system will help to facilitate these usurious facets of the female nature. Telling men that women are their natural partners instead of their natural vehicles for procreation, with their own separate interests and demands pertaining to said procreation, is tantamount to telling a person with a known genetic predisposition for alcoholism that the warm, fuzzy feelings he experiences while drinking are genuine feelings of happiness and relaxation instead of a biochemical, alcohol-induced farce that will eventually destroy his liver and kill him if he becomes dependent on it. We need to be honest with men, and, and we need to let them know that these extremely powerful romantic feelings they experience while under the haze of courtship is nothing more than a mechanism for getting men to take on the liability of a woman, and at great personal risk to himself both in prehistoric times when he was expected to furnish her with extra protection and sustenance, and in modern day civilization where the state willingly extends the lengths to which the female entitlement mentality naturally found in women can be deployed against men. We cannot, cannot tell men that women were there every step of the way, while men beat back the jungle and put civilization in its place because they loved men so much. I mean, it's preposterous. They were there because they needed to be. 
they were there because without the efforts of men, women would still be eking out some godforsaken nomadic existence full of danger and despair and misery, completely devoid of longevity and hope. And that spike in suicide rates correlate conveniently with the first time in human history where invention and mechanization and modern medicine allowed women to live long enough and with sufficient leisure time to pursue jobs devoid of physical labor that could only have been possible because of male ingenuity. Now I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but women bided their time and at the opportune moment made a decision to start competing with men. I mean, I'm sorry to break it to you, but that's what happened. Now, I don't need to be lectured on the negative effects of illegal immigration, for example. I understand that any economy has a fixed amount of jobs. I understand that unchecked illegal immigration creates unhealthy competition and lessens the job prospects of the actual citizens of the country in question. But, but, I, but I do find it funny just how quick men get up in arms when some Mexican migrant worker takes some back-breaking, grape-picking job out of the American job market. Uh, you know, then stop the presses because Mexicans, specifically male migrant workers, are now a separate and competing social and economic class that poses a direct threat to the mostly male American workers. Correcting, of course, for the countless HR paper-pushing jobs that women are given. And, and, you know, there would be some truth to that. I mean, you certainly wouldn't hear any friendly rhetoric about how these are our brothers and we need to work together for the sake of some feel-good made-up bullshit. They would be treated as a population in direct competition with the American worker. There would be no talk of working together so that the state can't divide us. You know, they, they would be competed against fiercely. And individual friendships between Mexicans and Americans would surely exist, but only within a larger context of economic competition. When women, however, are given college grants and job preferences and sexual harassment accommodations and maternity leave, when men are systematically pushed out of entire work industries, the best men can do is grumble about changing the laws so that women can go back to being our natural partners. I mean, I'm completely ignoring the fact that women gladly took all of those jobs they knew damn well they didn't earn, knowing that a man would be deprived of that job who would have gotten it without affirmative action. How about we start telling men about how women really view them first and foremost before we focus on changing any laws? I mean, how many less suicides would you see on this graph if men knew the true nature of women and subsequently decided to start competing with them right back instead of this please be our partners again while you give us an economic vivisection because you complete us bullshit? How many less male suicides if we had an educated male population even with the misandric wealth transfer laws in place. I mean, you can pass the most archaic alimony laws far exceeding what we have today, and if men aren't looking for those sweet little Cinderella soulmates, they won't be wrapping belts around their necks when it turns out that she was just a generic, hypergamous, highly scrutinized and categorized example of biological female self-interest. Now, I'm not telling men to not date women. I'm not telling them to not get laid. By all means, if you wish to enjoy the dance of courtship, I'm certainly not mad at you for it. But consider it the same way you would an act of social drinking or the occasional bong hit amongst friends. Yes, it feels good. Yes, it's enjoyable. But it's a temporary high. Don't become an alcoholic. Don't become a pothead. When you wake up the next day, learn to separate it from reality. So I really gotta say for now. Hi right, guys, this is gonna be a pretty informal discussion. I don't have time to script anything and uh, I just don't have a lot of time in general. But I've been meaning to talk about something for quite a while, namely the pathology of female uh, projection, psychological projection, uh, projection bias if you will. And normally I like to uh, make recourse to uh, evolutionary psychology and talk about the past, but as this is an informal video, I'm just going to be talking about uh, the present psychological projection, modern psychology. So what exactly is uh, psychological projection? Well, usually it's um, a form of defense mechanism when a person feels that uh, attributes or ideas or perhaps even actions on his or her part are undesirable that person will project uh, those negative qualities out on, onto someone else, attributing those qualities to the other person in an effort to avoid shame or feeling bad about oneself, something along those lines. That's usually how projection works. And uh, if you look at the way the human female interacts with the male, 
it's quite interesting because from a purely modern point of view or rather a, a, an isolated perspective independent of evolutionary psychology and our evolution it's quite fascinating to observe that the vast majority of traits uh, desired in a male by a female are traits that the female herself uh, almost in her entirety lacks or it could be actions let's start with commitment now we all know and we've heard very often that men are so-called commitment phobes uh, they don't want to enter in relationships they don't want to bind themselves to anyone but uh, as we know by now we know very very well by now uh, there is a vast amount mountains of evidence to suggest quite the opposite that women are the commitment phobes we see this in divorce rates we see this uh, in their uh, higher uh, frequency of cheating and so on and so forth uh, so it, it's very interesting that the female when I mean, we actually look at the evidence it accuses men of uh, being commitment folks we know for example that men are much more willing to forego sexual variety which is the male preference uh, in an effort to maintain a committed relationship. Women don't really know what commitment is or they when a woman talks about commitment they mean commitment for the time being until she finds something better. When man talks about commitment it's a big deal. Uh, I think that's part of the, the nature of this particular psychological projection on the part of the female. Uh, females being uh, pretty solipsistic and only can only can think from from their own perspective so if a male is truly weighing the pros and cons of a commitment long-term marriage something along those lines he really is thinking about long term till death do we part and all that uh, jazz the female on the other hand never thinks long she thinks well until I find something better at least on a subconscious level and I think that's the origin or one of the origins of this whole oh he's a commitment phobe uh, but it is very interesting because we do have the data, we have uh, statistics, evidence that suggests quite the opposite, that women are the commitment phobes, not men. Uh, and uh, it's just one of a long list of uh, psychological projections, in my observation, that, uh, fe that the female projects onto the male. What about uh, weakness? Now, if there's anything that women hate... Uh, in, in a man, there's anything. It's it's got to be weakness. Women despise weakness in men, uh, not weak men per se, but displays of weakness, uh, fallibility. Women hate that, and why? Well, uh, are women themselves particularly strong? No. Much of this, what women desire, is just seems to be a kind of mirror reflection of what they themselves lack, and. It seems to me that when a female encounters, say, weakness in a, in, a, in a male, that she is looking at the reflection in the mirror and that causes her great feelings of shame. That's one of the reasons why they despise weakness. Uh, it's, it's a self-reflection, uh, in essence. They see, the, they see their own weakness when a, when a male displays weakness. Of course, men in general, as we know, don't have any right to be weak or to fail or to falter. Uh, that would mean that they were human beings, and since men are human doings, automatons, machines of labor, beasts of burden, uh, they're not allowed to show any weakness or have any weakness for that matter. That's part of the bigger picture, but on, on, a, on a microcosmic scale, on a microscopic scale, I, I really do believe that the female uh, sees such qualities as weakness in, in, in men as a reflection of herself and she just simply doesn't have the capacity to come to terms with that that's why she despises it so much that's why she really hates weakness in men if a man you know, if God forbid a man feels insecurity some uh, momentary uh, momentary uh, faltering where he has doubts about his ability to complete a task. That will be held against him, of course. Uh, 
he's not allowed to feel that uh, feeling, have that feeling of insecurity. The female, on the other hand, I mean, that females are just riddled from the very essence, in the very essence, with insecurity. Another projection, another self, ref uh, a mirror reflection of what they themselves lack, and uh, of course, it's 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 criticized in men uh, when they when they show that. And men, being human beings in actuality, will occasionally feel insecure about certain things. Uh, and and the list goes on and on. It's it's not. Uh, I mean, the, the, you could list twenty other things, but the, the point is that all the desi the desirable attributes in a male, those attributes desired by a female in a male, they they really amount to. Uh, a kind of psychological projection, projection bias, a defense mechanism on the part of the female not to face her own weaknesses, her own insecurities, her own lack of commitment. Uh, it, it, it's, it's just fascinating to me that, uh, and so patently obvious in so many ways, that that's really what's going on. It, the, the level of um, contempt they have for any man who displays any doubts, any weakness, any failings? It's it's rather it's rather incredible. Uh, never mind the fact that the, the, it's laughable when they talk about commitment. We all know how committed women are. Women are of course committed to themselves. They're not very much committed to relationships or the men in those relationships. Uh, and it, those of you who watch my uh, video on lesbian relationships, uh, women aren't even committed to other women in in same-sex relationship so I don't uh, mem remember the divorce rate doubles when two women are involved doubles what the heterosexual rate is anyway uh, just wanted to make a brief informal video on that just uh, something food for thought and in case you do ever have an encounter it's something to think about and something you might want to mention uh, that uh, everything with regards to the qualities women seek in men is essentially self uh, self-projection kind of uh, it's just a defense mechanism and uh, <laughs> yes they hate 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 being reminded of that uh, they love uh, they love shooting down men who may occasionally display some of these qualities that they them that they themselves are so full of um, but uh, try to remind them the next time could have some interesting results there anyway uh, I have to uh, take off now and like I said didn't have a lot of time and by the way uh, I I my real life is quite turbulent these days I don't have time to make very frequent whip videos um, but they will be forthcoming and uh, I'm hoping I, it's a rough guesstimate maybe in a month's time then I'll be able to be more productive with regards to videos again but uh, that's just a really haphazard guess so anyway but thanks for bearing with me and uh, let me just say finally that I always appreciate the support I receive on this channel I mean in terms of comments and and views and uh, I really feel uh, because of some of the comments and messages I have received that I'm uh, doing something good for the benefit of uh, men individual men that is my goal and I'll reaffirm that. I mean, this channel is all about helping individual men, and that's really what I care about at the end of the day. Uh, I, I, I still believe that if we are going to smash the system and change things, it's going to happen on an individual basis. The less men buy into relationships and marriage and all the, the rest of the nonsense, the less cannon fodder there is, less meat there is for the meat grinder, um, the legal stuff, well, you know, it's all well and good, but at the end of the day, I do believe that the system is irrevocably, irretrievably broken, and because of that, I don't think, I don't think there's much that can be done, except as a, on a microscopic level, men going their own way, uh, refusing to enter into a, to marriage and possibly relationships. Uh, that will deprive women of their means of exploitation, but also the state of its means of exploitation. Uh, in the long run, well, it could have some pretty disastrous effects, but we're heading there anyway, regardless. And more and more men are waking up. You know, I, I, I'm fortunate in my, my uh, gaming 
And I talked to guys from all over the world, and uh, Australia, you know, France, uh, Asia, and uh, South America, and, and men are waking up. Men, they don't even know about the men's rights movement. They don't even know about my channel, but they are waking up one by one. And uh, they're making their own observations, and they're coming to astoundingly similar uh, conclusions. Of course, it, sh it shouldn't shock anyone. I mean, the things we talk about, the observations that we make, uh, they're generally based on female universal or female universal behavior. It's not surprising. Um, and that's very encouraging to know that there are other men out there uh, that uh, that are waking up without even you know having to sort of unplug themselves from the matrix as it were. Mm -hmm.